So, uh, hi everyone, I am Sean Rehag. Uh, I'm the director of the Refugee Law Laboratory, I'm also the director of the Center for Refugee Studies at York University, although I'm on sabbatical uh, this uh, year. Uh, and I'm also a faculty member at uh, Osgoode Hall Law School. I am uh, delighted that uh, today uh, we'll be hearing from Simon Wallace. Simon uh, is closely connected uh, with the Refugee uh, Law Lab. He's a research lawyer uh, at the lab. He's also an adjunct uh, faculty member at the um, Metropolitan University of Toronto. He is a JD candidate at, uh, not a JD candidate, <laughs> he was a JD candidate. Uh, he's an SJD candidate at uh, Osgoode uh, as well. Uh, he's going to be speaking to us uh, today about uh, some tools that he's been working on through uh, Obiter uh, AI uh, that are open source um, and that uh, are um, of particular uh, use, I think, for those of us who are uh, working on uh, computational approaches to uh, legal research. I know I've been using them uh, in my own research over the last uh, few weeks uh, and have found them to be uh, quite uh, helpful. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, uh, their development, um, uh, how they can be used and, and uh, future uh, directions. Uh, so Simon, uh, over to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so my objectives for the time we have are, are threefold. I want to speak briefly about uh, why it is I became interested in developing some uh, open source tools for legal researchers. Uh, two, I want to introduce you to the toolkit that I've developed so far, uh, talk about some of its capabilities and its future directions. And then three, I just want to do a very small demo uh, and actually get our hands dirty with the uh, with the code and see what it is that we can do so we can better orient ourselves to some of the opportunities uh, here for research. At bottom, uh, the problem that uh, inspired this is simple. It's a problem of scale. If uh, we look at uh, Canley, just the, the, federal, uh, the federal cases um, that are, are in this database, the volume of cases is really extraordinary. You know, the federal court, over 40,000 cases since uh, 1972. If we look at tribunals, uh, with you know, there are over 60,000 IRB cases. Uh, in the, the Canley data, database, which is actually a tiny percentage of uh, all IRB cases. You know, 11,000 Social Security Tribunal cases, 24,000 Veterans Review and Appeal Board cases. There's just so much law out there uh, that it exceeds human physiological capabilities to, to read that much. And my hypothesis and uh, the hypothesis, I think, of every single person interested in computational methodologies is that where humans are limited and can't read, can't hire enough research assistants to read, perhaps we can develop computer programs to do some of that work for us, to help us extract uh, interesting information, meaningful insights, and do things with data and legal metadata uh, to better understand a, a jurisprudence, for example. Uh, one advantage that we have in Canada over uh, many other jurisdictions is Canley itself. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, in Canada to have Canley and to have this public repository of data uh, and really quite uh, well organized data. If we just go into a random case here, you know, it is. Uh, extraordinary when you think about it, that we have every single federal court case, we've got active hyperlinks to uh, various bits of law, to uh, other cases. But just having this data available for an end user, for a reader, is, is somewhat limited. Uh, it's certainly, as a lawyer, useful for me to be able to go in and read and click links and explore. But for researchers, particularly researchers interested in developing empirical insights about, uh, about law, it's tantalizing, uh, but hard to, to weaponize, hard to use, um, because it's just there and there's only so much that we can read. Back in 2019, uh, Canley uh, released a, an API, uh, a, a mechanism for people who know how to code to uh, interact with some of its uh, databases, some of the information in its databases computationally. Uh, for um, sort of unfortunately, or just sort of a, a reality was that as 
far as I can tell, uh, this API uh, has been little used since 2019. Uh, but seeing this opportunity, seeing that there was this huge uh, data set with all sorts of information about, about the law uh, and a public API inspired me to uh, think about what it is that I could do as someone who knows how to code to expand uh, legal researchers and uh, lawyers and law students' capacity to interact with legal data at scale in new and interesting ways. So this led me to develop uh, Obrador AI, which I call um, an open source suite of uh, legal research tools. Right now, Obiter is basically um, two things. One, uh, I have yet to release the underlying code because I still need to clean it up. But one, uh, I've developed a, a program uh, which can which has uh, listened to um, a year and a half worth of Supreme Court of Canada decisions and made uh, auto transcripts, AI transcripts of uh, what was said uh, and diarized each speaker. So it listens, it does voice recognition on each person, grabs a screenshot of who's speaking and then uh, transcribes what it is that they have to say. Put it a different way, uh, this little project that you're seeing is a way of unlocking legal data that we haven't had access to before. Uh, so much of law happens orally, not in writing. And this is a, a technique to um, uh, extract uh, and, and obtain access to uh, some uh, information which has not been readily accessible to uh, legal researchers um, until now. But like I said, that's just sort of a small part. The main part of what Obiter AI is right now uh, is this computational mechanism for interacting with Canly and uh, and querying the, cata the Canly database uh, at scale. Really, when we boil it down, the, uh, the functionality is quite simple. Uh, it's a number of ways, um, uh, it's a number of different ways using um, uh, a Python library to interact uh, with Canly collect data about cases and sort them, uh, sort that data in interesting ways. Um, really uh, just interacting with the, the metadata of various cases. For those of you who know how to program in Python, this will look uh, quite familiar. For those of you which, who don't, uh, don't be intimidated. What you're really seeing here, and I'm gonna show you an example in a second, is, uh, uh, a sort of a command line implementation, more or less, of a program I developed, and that you uh, interact using, interact with uh, uh, using code. Put differently, it's a way of just getting information using a, a few simple methods. So let's just go in, and I can demonstrate some of this for you. So what we'll do now is just a really simple research project together. Uh, um, I have for the next 15 minutes, got three research questions uh, I wanna answer, and we're gonna work through how we would use Obiter to answer those questions. I wanna examine every immigration uh, federal court case decided in January, 2023, uh, and look for uh, the answers to three questions. One, which case uh, has been cited most often uh, by federal court judges in, uh, in January, 2023, um, then uh, which level of court are judges uh, citing most often. And then I want to see whether we can, based off of citations, group cases together uh, into communities to see whether or not an algorithm can uh, separate and begin to organize a, a jurisprudence for us. Let me walk through what's happening in the code. So at the beginning, I'm just going to run each cell individually. Um, uh, I'm calling, uh, I'm loading uh, Obiter. So all the methods that uh, I've developed, all the code I've developed, I'm just pulling in. And I'm making what we call an object, an API caller uh, that uh, I can use to get information from Canly. And normally this would require um, some lines of code, maybe 20 or 30 lines of code to, to do everything. But basically what I've done is 
packaged all of that into this. So it just does a lot of the work for you uh, when you um, uh, call in various methods. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Obiter to show me all the tribunals in the Canley database. So API caller say list the tribunals. And this uh, tells us that there are 367 different tribunals in the, the Canley database. Because we're interested in the federal court, I'm going to narrow in on uh, just federal tribunals, uh, just the Canadian jurisdiction, and go down. Okay, and here's the federal court. And I see that the federal court has a, a, a specific um, moniker, FCT. And I'm going to take this information and I'm going to uh, get a, a, a list of all the decisions from the FCT database, the federal court database. I'll take up to 500. Uh, all decisions decided between December 31st, 2022 and January 30th, 2023. And I'll send that to Canley. And now I get a list of all the decisions uh, decided at that time. If we go back, uh, you know, this is um, uh, nothing too complicated. We can get the same thing uh, interacting with Canley normally, but this is just a way of getting the same list computationally. Now that I've got this list, I said that my interest was in uh, just uh, doing a small research project on immigration decisions. Uh, this isn't a particularly principled way of doing this, but it'll work for our purposes. I'm going to sort uh, or filter just for the cases that have the word citizenship in the, the style of cause. There are better ways of identifying uh, uh, immigration cases, but this is just one way that I'm going to do today. And having done that, I've got 71 cases. So 71 cases in January 2023 decided by the federal court that seem to be about citizenship and immigration, where the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration uh, was a, a litigant. Now, if we go back, and if we look at a case, we see that Canley has identified uh, more or less every single case that was cited and identified it in a, a computational way uh, that and pulled it out and made a connection to some other case. I'm interested in these connections. I want to see what we can uh, we can do with them. And so I'm going to create what's called an edge list, or to put differently, for every single case, I'm going to tell Obiter to go in and pull every single citation within uh, within a decision and do that for all 71 cases uh, uh, decided in January. So it'll take maybe 20 or 30 seconds. And once I have this, what we call edge list, uh, we'll be able to do a little bit of, of summary analysis uh, to, to learn some things about uh, the, the jurisprudence. As we wait, this is always the, um, the worrying part as a, um, as a coder, you always worry that the, the moment you demonstrate something, the, the server is going to go down and you're not going to get any data. Okay, so here's our edge list. And what we see is the original case. So this first one, uh, Descua, and then many, many entries for that original case, and then associated with each original case, uh, with each entry, a citation. So one of the citation, each one of the citations is now associated. So we've got original case and then all the citations. And if we scroll down, we see, okay, in January, 2023, there were 654 uh, citations in immigration cases. We can uh, take a look and see what case was cited most. So here I'm taking my edge list I'm saying just look at the cited case title and give me the 10 most cited cases. Okay, so the most cited case, Vavilov, that makes a lot of sense, followed by Toth, uh, which is a, a case about um, 
uh, injunctive relief for its days of removal, RJR McDonald, same thing, injunctive relief, Kantasame, an HHC case, uh, uh, Canadian Pacific is a procedural fairness case and uh, uh, goes on broadcast. CBC is another injunction case. So it's, you know, it feels like we're we're in the immigration space. Yeah, actually, let's just let's look at the top thirty. Yeah, Sarash, Ward, Kosa. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, and now let's take a look at the uh, the level of court that the uh, the federal court was citing. So remember, I, my first research question was, who are federal court judges citing most often in immigration cases? Okay, Supreme Court Bavilov. Okay, but which level are they citing? Now, so what I'm doing here is I'm going back to my citation. And I, I look at the citation and I say, all oh, right, okay, I know how neutral citations work. Generally, in the middle here is always the the court uh, that's involved, and so I'm going to write a little uh, a little bit of code that will break up the citation and just isolate for the middle part of the citation, so I can figure out what level of court is being uh, cited most often, and that's what this code is doing right now. Okay, so of the 600 some odd cases. It looks like a majority, a large majority, are federal court cases. So federal court uh, judges are most often citing other federal court judges, then followed by the Supreme Court, then FC, FCA, then interesting Canley, which is probably old cases uh, that uh, predated the the, new, the invention of the neutral citation, or maybe state decisions which um, uh, don't always get neutral citations. Old federal court uh, federal court trial level, and then uh, BC Court of Appeal. Interesting. Okay, so those are our first two research questions solved. Uh, who, uh, which case was cited most often uh, in January, and which level of court was cited uh, most often in, in that one month? Okay, let's do something a little more complex now. So we've got all these cases, and for every single one of the 71 cases, we know every single other case that they were cited. To put it a different way is we've got the foundation for um, uh, to build kind of a social network or uh, a kind of uh, to do a network analysis, looking at how all the cases are networked together and how they cite each other might then be information we can use to better understand uh, what the, the court was doing in this one month. For this, I'm going to rely on another open source package called NetworkX. Uh, which is a, um, it's called a graph tool, but it's a, a, a tool researchers use to do graph or network analyses. And I'm going to take all the data that Obiter produced and load it into network X, X and make a network. And we call that a graph or G. And we'll just take a look at what that looks like. So I'll draw this, this network. Okay. So this is what uh, the uh, the network of uh, January 2023 federal court cases uh, looks like, and it's chaotic, uh, but we can see a few things um, are happening right off the top. So all these ones around the edge, it looks like, okay, those are cases which are maybe cited once uh, by um, by the, the the 71 cases. You know, we can kind of see an arrow uh, going out. Uh, so we see there's these 71 cases that are all in the middle and they go the, all the outward citations. But we can also see there are a few more where there are a lot of citations. So this, I, I bet, is Vavilov uh, right here, the, this case. Uh, and we can see that, you know, sometimes they're actually citing each other within uh, a particular month or there are a few cases over here where there are a bunch of, of uh, ones um, uh, citing them. So even though it's really chaotic and even though it's really uh, disorganized, just by looking at it, we can see that there may be patterns here uh, to be explored. And we can do a little bit of summary analysis. Like, okay, so number of uh, nodes, this tells us that there are in total in this network, there are 548 nodes, these blue dots, which is each, each case. So if you take all 71 cases and every citation, this network knows about 548 cases and all the connections between, well, not all the connections between all 548, but a, a number of the connections between them. 
And we know that there are 654 edges or connections. Eh, interesting. What I'm gonna do now though, is try to organize these a bit more. And I'm going to invoke a really simple uh, uh, algorithm called greedy modularity communities, which sounds complicated, but I'll explain it in a second to help me group some of these cases together. So the greedy modularity uh, communities algorithm is a very simple one and works in a, uh, in a, uh, a pretty basic way. So it takes all the cases and looks at all of them and then finds the two cases that are most connected and links them and says, you guys are a community. And then it does that again and finds the next most uh, uh, linked cases where they're the most linkages and keeps on doing that uh, and keeps connecting and building groups of cases until there's no more advantage, uh, no more connectivity to be gained by um, by merging uh, cases. And so th using this very simple approach, we're gonna see whether or not uh, we can uh, organize the jurisprudence in an interesting way. So first we'll just visualize it. Okay, so actually the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna see how many communities does this really simple algorithm find. And it's telling us that in all of this chaos, there are 20 groups that actually look kind of similar uh, that are, are connected. And let's see if we can take a look at that. Okay, so it doesn't actually look all that good, but each one of these colors represents a different community. Uh, and uh, uh, there's not too much that jumps out at me. But what I can do is uh, I can write a little bit of code to say, okay, well, let's go back to each one of our 71 cases and tell me what community each one of those is in and give me a link and we'll go explore and we'll see if there's uh, some connections we can see. So this code uh, will do that for us. Okay. So here's our first community, our community number zero, and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cases. Okay. So let's see if there's a commonality between these seven cases. Okay. The first one, okay. brings a motion for a stay of removal. Second one, uh, seeks a stay of removal. Third one, has been directed to report for removal, has applied for an order stay in order pending it. Uh, final assessment of her application, denying her pra. Okay, and this is another stay of removal case. So just by looking at all the citations uh, and seeing where there were sort of commonalities and where there were connectivities, it's found uh, all of the um, uh, all of the the motions to to stay removal in the the data set. Um, let's look at another one. Okay, let's say two. Okay, uh, JR inadmissible misrep. Here applied for a visa. Officer found proof of funds were fraudulent. Okay, so it's we're in the misrep space again. Uh, seeks JR of an officer refusing TRP failed to respond properly to a question and omitted to disclose a prior US visa revocation. Okay, so it's found a bunch of misrep cases and, and grouped them together. Uh, let's look at one more. Okay, H&C case. Another H&C case. And this is a, another H&C case. Okay, so what we've seen is that just by uh, just with this very small uh, data set, which even included a bunch of cases which had no connections to any others, uh, this very simple algorithm was begin uh, was able to begin to start to organize uh, the jurisprudence in actionable and interesting ways, uh, where without even reading a single case, it grouped like cases together and uh, uh, in a way that um, uh, let us fi potentially find interesting things about that. Okay, and then we'll see, this might just take a long time, uh, more time than we have, but I'm curious to see what would happen if we did it for 
uh, all of 2022. So I'll just start running that code and maybe uh, it'll be done by 1.30 and we can take a look. So this very little bit, this very, sort of very small uh, introduction uh, shows, I think, a few things. One, how uh, we have access uh, through the metadata available to us through uh, Canly to really interesting data sets, uh, which without too much work, we can do, uh, we can manipulate and do things with to extract uh, interesting conclusions. The study of law using computational methods in Canada is young, and one of the my objectives is to keep building out the tool set and make it easier and easier for uh, researchers and students to uh, work with so that they can uh, eventually, um, you know, I, I, I sort of hope that uh, this is, uh, uh, this looks to people like uh, uh, over the year, like a thousand different uh, third year major research projects for for law students uh, uh, to analyze um, uh, uh, the case law. As uh, I'm going to keep developing this, uh, so like I said, I've got this transcriber, which I'll uh, be releasing soon. I'm going to uh, uh, release some um, uh, functionality to make it easier to do network analyses so people don't have to do even nearly as much code as I did. Uh, and I have a number of other things which I'll be moving into this, hopefully which will make it easy for um, a number of researchers to do a number of interesting things going forward. All the code is available uh, just on GitHub if anyone's interested in seeing uh, what it looks like. It's just all right here. Uh, and if you are working on it and you find bugs, please uh, do let me know and I'll, I'm happy to fix them. Um, so that's uh, what I wanted to talk about and what I wanted to show today. I do think it's a really exciting time for us to be exploring what uh, these sorts of methodologies can do and how we can uh, leverage them. Uh, and uh, I look forward to having a discussion that we may have. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Simon, for the, the presentation and for creating this tool. As I said, I've been using it in, uh, in, uh, in my research, and I found it very, uh, very helpful. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have um, just a conversation in this small uh, group here. Uh, before we do, our practice at the Refugee Law Lab is not to record uh, Q&A uh, sessions, so I'm going to stop the uh, recording here.